So let's start. So uh, my name is uh, Martin Linksel. I am a Microsoft MVP in the uh, M365 development category, and I've been a Microsoft 365 architect with uh, a company in the Netherlands called uh, I4U. And I think we've been like working with SharePoint Framework right from the very beginning, like something like seven years ago. So and and lately I was looking back at how uh, at all those years and. I found that kind of drifted or used several ways to arrange my development environment. So I apparently slowly drifted across several options of uh, of setting things up. Um, and I think the only option I have not tried is using uh, uh, programming SPFX on a MacBook. So probably there are some people who may have an opinion on that, but you'll have to wait for another day. So the idea of this presentation is like to um, to demo a bit on uh, the different ways to set things up. Um, and to see why we moved from uh, initially just Windows uh, across to Docker, across to the dev drive, and see why we did that and some pros and cons. So I'd like to just dive into that. Um, uh, let me start with uh, with the, the first option, of course, which is uh, vanilla Windows. Now, the, the, the main, um, this is, of, of course, this is like the most simple uh, way you can just start development uh, uh, SPFX. So just you know, um, you just get the uh, the getting started guide out from uh, from the from the Microsoft documentation. You will start working, and this is what we what we did all the time. So uh, this is us, you know, like working in a in a in a folder and just start uh, run the Yeoman templater and uh, create our web parts and so on and so on. And this is of course it's very simple. It's very basic. We can just uh, run this and. The only thing we need is Node.js. We need uh, our global dependencies and everything else. And this is very, very nice, of course. But um, so it's easy to start with. But there's also some challenges with doing things this way. So there's basically two things that we uh, ran into while we were working this initially. Uh, and this is the first thing is that the Windows file system is like notoriously slow when running npm install. So in the beginning, we we used to have like that we had to wait like 15 minutes before we could start developing our SPFX solutions. So I've recently tried it again, and it seems to have gotten a lot faster also with uh, the newer versions of MP or, or of Node.js and NPM. But still, it's still quite slow, and it, this is a, a well-known thing. Um, and the second reason we, we, we started to look elsewhere is that there's not really a way to separate your projects from your host system. So everything you have, you, you've installed on your host system influ can influence your the way you uh, program your SPFX project. So for example, what we are often doing is that we, for example, we'll have to build a project for a new customer, which is awesome. And we use, for example, SPFX 1.18, for example. And then on the same day, we'll have to move back and manage a project for another customer, which is like uh, running on uh, SPVX 116 or something like that. And as you know, the different SharePoint framework versions all uh, are pinned to different Node.js versions and different NPM versions. So this brings us with a very uh, interesting challenge. You know, how can we manage that on our on our device in a way that's really uh, good? So how can we work with the different SharePoint framework versions in a in a in a nice way? And the second reason why this is challenging is that of course, well, we are not alone in working on these SPFX projects. So a lot of times um, uh, I would be building uh, SPFX projects and I would pass them along to my colleagues and they would have to try to run those SPFX projects on their machine. And then we often ran into the situation where they had like, I mean, they also had Node.js installed and still they had to, uh, they, it took them a while to get this project running on their machine. And this, uh, these are two very annoying uh, things that you will have to uh, that you'll have to work with. Um, so these two reasons were like the, the reasons why we looked further. So how can we find better ways to uh, to to do this? And the first way we uh, we did we tried was to to try um, uh, Linux on Windows. So you can these days you can install uh, Windows subsystem Linux, which is essentially just running. A, just running Linux on your Windows machine. And this is awesome. This is really like a, a very good um, alternative to just running on your Windows uh, C drive, for example, because Linux file operations are much faster than the Windows file operations are. So running NPM install is really 
uh, a much faster operation. So let me just show you. Um, this is what we just did. I mean, we've got Linux running on my machine here, and I can just uh, open a bash shell, and I can just start uh, install my dependencies here and start running, and see well what do I want to do. Uh, well, let me try something else. So so I can just run it here, and I can just start it up. And this is really a very fast way to work uh, with SharePoint Framework. And the great thing is you can also interact with it through the uh, through Explorer because uh, WSL uh, Windows Subsystem Linux is also visible from the from the Explorer. So you can just go and browse through your uh, file structure, and you can see all your projects and and work with them. So we really like this because it is well, it's very fast. Um, but still, it's not really a good solution for one of the challenges we had run into, but because there's still not really a separation between uh, your projects and your host system. I mean, the host system has just changed. It's now Linux instead of Windows, but there's still you still have these global dependencies that are that may influence the work you're doing. Um, and of, of course, another challenge may be that you will re it will require some knowledge of Linux uh, and. Well, I'm not a person born with a Raspberry Pi in their hands. I'm not sure how many of you are, but still, it's. I mean, it's a different way to work. Um, uh, you like to like Bash, for example. I personally like PowerShell more. Uh, but maybe you can run PowerShell Core inside your uh, WSL distribution. I don't know, but uh, it's uh, it's. I mean, it's it's a thing. You, you need to to dive into that and and learn a bit of uh, using Linux. So, uh, because of the first challenge, like the, the separation thing, we started to look further, and this was when we ran into uh, Docker. So, uh, Docker is, of course, well, it's a well-known system these days. It's just a way to run a kind of like run a VM on your local machine, for example, and, of course, you can run Docker containers everywhere you like. Um, it's really a very good system. I mean, it's it's like you're running a Linux very, very a containerized Linux instance on your machine. And you can use this in combination with a fantastic um, implementation of PS Code called Dev Containers to, um, to work with SPFX. And this is really a very powerful. I mean, this, this is like ultimate separation between what you're working with and your host system. I mean, you're creating a new host system every time you create a project, something like that. Uh, and of course, you also have fast file system operations also on Windows if you're using a, um, a Linux backend. So um, uh, we really like this initially. Uh, I'll just show you how it's uh, how it's working with me. So what, what we did, I mean, you can do it in two ways. Let's start here. We ourselves would do is we, we, we really liked our code a bit more in one folder, you know, like that we had all our customers code like side by side, like you could just browse through it. Uh, using WSL. So what we would often do is um, is just clone um, a template from uh, one of, from our Azure DevOps, a, a a basic like Dev Container template. We would clone it into a folder in WSL, um, just like this, and then we would open it in VS Code. And now, as you can see, I've got this basic Dev Container files. Um, that I can, you know, like influence. Like this is the Docker file that this whole idea is based upon, and it will just install some uh, basic things like Gulp CLI, Yeoman, uh, generator of SharePoint, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, everything we would need. And if we and we can just run this and rebuild it and open it inside a container. So this is really powerful. We we were doing this all all day long. Um, and I really liked it. So I've got one of these. I think I've got one of these here. Let me show it. Um, because I mean, the initial install process of Docker of, of a dev container is quite long because it will have to build the image. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that I found very uh, annoying about it. But as, if you, as soon as you had it, it was very very fast working. So we could just rebuild and reopen it inside a container. And just work with it. Um, so I really like this uh, initially. I, I, we we kind of worked a long time with it, and the great thing is, I mean, I can just uh, whenever I need this, uh, my whole machine may have changed, but I can just rebuild the image, and it will just work. And the same if I pass this over to to my colleagues, 
if they've got Docker and Devcontainers installed, they can just open this, rebuild it, open it in container, and it will just work, uh, more or less. Because, I mean, the host system, that's, that's the thing that you're passing along in the form of this Docker file and the dev container. This is just the definition of the system in which this SPFX solution is running. So uh, we found this a very nice way of working, but there were some um, downsides, quite some actually. Um, I personally disliked the extra added complexity. I mean, it can be challenging to set up uh, a Docker file. It can be challenging to keep it up to date, uh, certainly for people not really used to working with uh, Linux, for example, people like me. So it's like, um, it's like difficult, it's more difficult also to onboard new colleagues who, are, who have no experience working with it. Uh, and also what I found very annoying is that Docker will, it will have a very significant memory footprint in your machine. And I never really figured out a good way of reducing that. So, you know, it's just like Teams. If you're in a Teams call, it's like the system kind of explodes because it's using up a lot of uh, memory. And the same with, uh, with Docker, it will use a lot of memory. Um, and the third thing is also is of course the very slow start of the initial the first time you're creating a project because the container has to be built or the image has to be built on your machine. Um, so the separation between projects and the, and your host system is really very powerful, and I think that's really useful in some scenarios. But it's also uh, it's also a challenge because it's so separated from your system that um, I mean you also you always also get these little annoyances like. For example, what if I want to download an image to my doc container? You know, so, simple things like that. I mean, if you're working on Windows, you, you don't have to think about that. But when you're working with Docker, it suddenly becomes a challenging thing. Uh, or for example, things like if, you, if you're running a Docker container, it, what it will do, it will bind the SPFX ports, you know, 5432, it will bind those to the ports uh, of your uh, machine. So if you're now opening two solutions side by side, you can debug them at the same time, things like that, you know, it's, uh, there is added complexity. And this is, you, um, you, there is a possibility that you wouldn't, uh, that you wouldn't like it. The question is, um, is the added complexity worth what it, uh, what it gives you? Is the ultimate separation, like what I'm telling you here, is that really necessary? That's, I think, the big question why you would consider using it or not. So in the end, for us, it um, turned out that the challenges weren't really worth the be the benefits weren't really worth the challenges. So we we thought, I mean, let's let's look further. And that was actually the time when um, the Windows Dev Drive was uh, introduced. And Windows Dev Drive is actually just a, a virtual hard disk that you can create on your machine, and it's using a different file system and it's got some optimizations and. We tried it out and it was actually super fast, much faster than the default uh, windows, uh, when, than, than working on default windows. Um, and this is very, very powerful, very, uh, very fast. I, I really like this. I mean, um, we are using NVM, the node version manager, to get at least some separation between projects. Um, uh, I mean, you'll need to switch node versions uh, as still uh, if you're moving back to uh, to different uh, projects, or um, you'll need to check uh, check out if you're passing along the project to another to a colleague. So you'll have to know, or um, they'll have to know, and they'll have to install the right versions of of their global dependency still. This is this is a thing that that, that we'll still have to do, but it's much faster, and it's just Windows. It's also uh, I think that that's really positive. I mean, I can just work with with PowerShell. I can just uh, do all the things like I'm used to doing them, and it's and, and it just works. So as long as you're just um, as you're, I, I mean, as long as your uh, as NVM is working for you, this is really a very powerful thing to use. Um, so the challenges, I think, I mean, it's not no real separation uh, still. I mean, NVM is very powerful, but it also comes with a couple of uh, a couple of challenges or a couple of things. For example, if you switch your node version, uh, it will also switch all the globally installed dependencies with it. So um, for me, that is annoying because it may be that I'm, I'm, I need to switch back to another node version and I'm forgetting that on, that I had a different version, for example, of the CLI for Microsoft 365 installed there. You know, it's um, it kind of can get confusing. So you, you'll have to 
there are ways to get around that, but it's uh, it's something to keep in mind. So, um, what so what's the conclusion? Well, I think there is no really no, no really a right choice in this. The right choice depends, I think, on your organization and how you are working together. So, do you regularly work on the same project uh, with? I mean, with colleagues, maybe how many colleagues do you have? How structured is your the way you want to work together? Um, maybe are you maintaining older projects? That's all, of course, that's a, a thing to keep in mind. Um, if you're often switching between projects, it would be nice to have some separation in place. Um, but if you're if you're going the direction of dev containers or Docker, the, the big question would be: Is there something in your someone in your company that's knowledgeable about these things, about using Linux, about using Docker, and maybe uh, people that maintain those uh, images for you? So these are the things you will uh, you need to think about when uh, when choosing what's the best way for you. For us, it's uh, um, it's dev drive now, and but I don't I don't um, I don't know maybe you know. Maybe some something better will come along, and we'll just and we'll switch over again. You never know. It's just we need to be um, sharp and uh, keep looking at the possibilities. I think, and uh, this is what uh, what we try to do: keep open to uh, to new possibilities. Okay, so um, that's it. I do have some resources here, so if you want to dive more into these subjects, uh, do give them a try. And uh, thank you for your attention. Back to you, Hugo.